Dear students, let us revise the cranial nerves and their brainstem nuclei related neural columns, which is an important topic for the purpose of PG entrance exam, especially for the next coming NEET PG in the month of March 2023. And all the best for your exam. As we talk about the cranial nerves, there are 12 pair of cranial nerves and in those 12 pair of cranial nerves, most of them will be actually coming from the brain stem but as we talk about the cranial number one and two they do not come from the brain stem cranial nerve number one which is the olfactory nerve carrying the sensation of smell basically belongs to teleencephalon part of the brain and if we are talking about cranial nerve number two that is the optic nerve then it is a nerve of the diencephalon and none of them actually belong to the brain stem so what is the brain stem giving us which cranial nerves the brain stem means three component of the brain that is the midbrain and the pons and the medulla oblongata and from here we find that cranial number 3 to 12 are coming so brain stem is basically giving us the cranial number 3 to 12 our discussion will be chiefly based upon the cranial number 3 to 12 coming from the brain stem and their nuclei but briefly we can talk about the cranial number 1 and 2 as well in the coming diagram the view which we are having at the moment is uh, anterior inferior view of the brain like this patient is lying supine the feet are towards us the head is away from the observer and this is a CT scan machine in which the patient is going basically you are looking from the anterior inferior view that is the base of the brain we'll be talking about the dissected specimen of brain and uh, the details of cranial nerves here but before that let us have an overview by looking at a schematic diagram let us first magnify this diagram, talk about the cranial nerves, have some orientation and then we can observe them in the actual brain as well. So as I mentioned, it is the anterior inferior view or the base of the brain where we want to talk about the 12 pair of cranial nerves. Talking about the first cranial nerve, that is the olfactory nerve, it is actually going to arise from the roof of nasal cavity and synapse here in what is called as the olfactory bulb. So this is the olfactory bulb where we will have the synapse of the cranial number one olfactory nerve. After that what you see is the olfactory tract which is coming towards the cerebrum. So this is about the cranial number one pathway. As we talk about the cranial number one it is the nerve of teleencephalon whereas the nerve of diencephalon is the optic nerve bringing the visual information. So here as we find this is the cranial number two the optic nerve and the axons are coming here on the right side and the optic nerve on the left side is shown here. Cranial number two the nerve of diencephalon then we can Comment upon the now number 3 to 12 coming from the brain stem. The three component of brain stem would be seen here. The midbrain, the pons and the medulla blangata. What we find here is a part of the midbrain anteriorly what is called as the crust cerebri which is evident here. So as we mentioned this is the crust cerebri part of the midbrain and below that we can see is the pons and still inferior to that would be the medulla oblongata. So here is the medulla oblongata. As we have mentioned, the brainstem will have three components, the midbrain, the pons, and the medulla oblongata, giving us cranial number three to 12. So where is the number three coming from? The number three is the oculomotor nerve and it is coming from the midbrain arising at the level of superior colliculus. This is seen on one side and on the other side as well. The oculomotor nerve. And not only oculomotor nerve but also the trochlear nerve. Cranial number 4 will come from the midbrain. The number 3 coming at the level of superior colliculus. The number 4 coming at the level of inferior colliculus. And all the cranial nerves basically they exit ventrally but the trochlear nerve. Cranial number 4 exit dorsally. Later it will come ventral. It can also be identified by the fact that this nerve is quite thin. Actually the thinnest cranial nerve because it is having very few axons. So here is the trochlear nerve. The thinnest cranial nerve very close to the thickest cranial nerve which is trigeminal nerve. Trigeminal nerve is three nerves into one bringing a lot of axons so becomes thickest cranial nerve and will be evident here. Now this uh, 
trigeminal nerve as having one motor and one sensory component running together and they are arising from the pons. So the number three, four will come from the midbrain, whereas the number five, that is the trigeminal nerve, is coming from the pons. You can see the motor and sensory component of trigeminal nerve on the other side as well, coming from the pons. Now, what about the nerve number six, that is the abducens nerve? May it be the number six, seven, or eight? They are all coming at the pontomedullary junction, which is evident here. So before that, it is the pons, and after that, it is the medulla oblongata. And at the junction of pons and medulla oblongata, we are having the number six, seven, eight coming. The most medial is the abducens nerve, which is evident here. The cranial nerve number six at the pontomedullary junction. The most medial nerve on both sides we can show. Lateral to that will be the cranial number seven, which is having a motor and sensory component. So here is the facial nerve or cranial number seven coming at the pontomedullary junction. Just lateral to that will be the eighth cranial nerve, the vestibulocochlear nerve for hearing and the balance. So here we see the vestibulocochlear nerve, cranial number eight, again at the pontomedullary junction. What about the nerve number nine then? As we talk about cranial number nine, 10, 11, or 12, they will be coming from the medulla oblongata. So as we move on towards the medulla oblongata, there we can show the number nine, 10, 11, and 12 related to the structures which are called as pyramid, which are near the midline, and olive, which are laterally present. Now the cranial number 9, which is glossopharyngeal nerve as evident here, or the nerve number 10, which is the vagus nerve, and cranial number 11, which is accessory part of 11th nerve, cranial accessory nerve found running with the vagus nerve, are evident here. So nerve number 9, 10, 11, as you see here, this is nerve number 9, that is glossopharyngeal nerve, and nerve number 10, along with that runs the cranial path of 11, making a vagus accessory complex, the number 10, 11, but the cranial part of 11. They all come from medulla oblongata, lying behind the olive. The 11th nerve will have one spinal part also, which is called a spinal accessory nerve, coming from the spinal cord, and we will focus upon that also, but at the moment, continuing with the medulla oblongata, you can see the 12th nerve as well, as you see, the axons are coming sandwiched between pyramid anteriorly and olive posteriorly. So this is the 12th nerve or cranial nerve called as the hypoglossal nerve. We can show it on the other side as well. The number 12 or hypoglossal nerve. The axons arising between pyramid anterior and olive posterior. Both the structures located on the anterior aspect of medulla oblongata. Now talking about the spinal part of accessory nerve as is evident here. It is arising from the spinal cord, cervical 1 to cervical 5. So coming from the spinal cord C1 to C5, we will see the spinal part of accessory nerve. The spinal part of accessory nerve then meets the cranial part of accessory nerve and start moving together. We have shown the spinal accessory nerve here on one side and it is evident on the other side as well. So this is spinal accessory nerve but it is coming from the spinal cord. Now we want to see all these cranial nerves in the actual specimen of the brain, a dissected specimen. The view will be the similar anterior inferior view of the brain talking about the 12 pair of cranial nerves once again. We look at the base of the brain and talking about the 12 pair of cranial nerves, this is the schematic diagram which we are using to identify them in the actual dissected specimen of brain. The very first nerve, that is the olfactory nerve, is coming from the roof of nasal cavity and will be synapsing here in the olfactory bulb. And from the olfactory bulb, shown on both the side, the olfactory tract can be followed towards the cerebrum. So this is the olfactory tract. Then talking about the optic nerve, the nerve with the vision, you will find this is the second cranial nerve. And in the dissected specimen of brain, it is evident here on one side and on the other side. The optic nerve, cranial nerve number two, then as we talk about the number 3 to 12, they'll be coming from the brainstem, the number 3, the oculomotor nerve coming from the midbrain at the level of superior colliculus is evident here. I'm marking the oculomotor nerve on this side as well as on the other side. Finding the trochlear nerve will be difficult because it is quite very thin. 
the thinnest cranial nerve having very few axons again coming from the midbrain and as we locate it it is seen on this side this very thin nerve so this is the trochlear nerve on one side on the other side it is almost in evident so that is the trochlear nerve nerve number three four coming from the midbrain what about the nerve number five the trigeminal trigeminal nerve is the thickest cranial nerve having a lot of axons and will be coming from the pons so here is the trigeminal nerve coming from the pons on this side and the other side also it is evident the trigeminal nerve now as we talk about the now number six seven eight they are at the ponto medullary junction now number six is the most medial which is evident here now number six that is the abducens nerve on either side coming at the ponto medullary junction above this is the pons and below is the medulla oblongata so this is the abducens nerve now number six what about now number seven now number seven is evident here as we see Again, at the ponto medullary junction and lying still lateral to that will be the vestibulocochlear nerve, nerve of hearing balance, that is the eighth nerve. So here, as we talk about the eighth nerve, it is vestibulocochlear nerve still lying lateral, again at the ponto medullary junction. And when it comes to nerve number 9, 10, 11, they'll be coming from the medulla oblongata, lying posterior lateral to the olive. Let us demarcate them as well. The number nine, which is the glossopharyngeal nerve, is evident here. Very few axons can be seen. And following that is the vagus nerve. Now number 10, along with the vagus comes the cranial path of accessory. Actually there is vagus accessory complex having the vagus nerve and cranial part of accessory nerve coming together and you can see few axons of 11th nerve as well with the 10th nerve. So basically cranial accessory nerve and the vagus nerve come together as is evident here. Though later we find that it is the spinal cord giving us C1 to C5 the spinal accessory nerve is joining the cranial accessory nerve. So here we are showing the spinal accessory nerve coming from the spinal cord and going to join the cranial accessory nerve. Now we have seen nerve number 9, 10, 11. What about the nerve number 12, which is hypoglossal nerve? It is also coming from the medulla oblongata, but it is more anterior towards the midline, sandwiched between pyramid anterior and olive posterior. So as we talk about cranial number 12 or hypoglossal nerve, the axons are evident here. There are a lot of rootlets which are arising from the medulla oblongata and we are just trying to make them visible in this diagram. So that is the 12th nerve hypoglossal nerve. Now we need to magnify this diagram and just look at the brainstem itself so as to identify these nerves in more detail. In fact, if the examiner is giving a schematic diagram, it is easy to identify them. But in a dissected specimen, we must train our eyes how to identify them. First of all, we should know what is their location they are coming from. And number two, the relative orientation with each other. The diagram which we are drawing is going to be the brainstem, the three component of brainstem and showing some of the nuclei there. So let us assume this is the midline of the body and we are looking from the front view. This is the diagram showing three parts of the brainstem, which you can mark here. Basically, it is going to be the midbrain, followed by the pons in the middle. And then we can talk about the medulla oblongata as well. Now, it is understood that the nucleus of the number three and the number four will be found in the midbrain. When you talk about the nucleus, it means collection of neuron bodies. So there'll be some collection of neuron bodies at the level of superior colliculus, which is the number three sending some axons out so that is the oculomotor nerve basically if we are having the collection of axons then it is called nerve and if it is the collection of neuron bodies then it is called as nucleus then we understand at the level of inferior colliculus in the midbrain we will have the nucleus of the number four and when we trace the axons they'll be creating the trochlear nerve in your number four so the number three four come from the midbrain their nuclei are also at the level of midbrain what about the number 5678? The nucleus for number 5678 will be found in the pons. But then we have to understand there can be overlapping nuclei. For example, when we talk about the eighth nerve, some of the neuron bodies are present in the pons and some of them extend into medulla oblongata. So they are basically at the ponto medullary junction. The eighth nerve nuclei or vestibulocochlear nuclei, which we can show here, partly in the pons, partly in the medulla oblongata. Now these vestibulocochlear nuclei 
are taking care of the hearing and balance. If you remember, we have discussed in lateral medullary ischemia, that is Wallenberg syndrome, there can be vertigo. And why does that happen? Some artery which was supplying the lateral medulla has been blocked and there is ischemia. And there is compromised vestibular nuclei resulting in vertigo. So vertigo is one of the feature of a syndrome which we call as lateral medullary syndrome or the Wallenberg syndrome. We'll be looking at some more features of this syndrome. But here, as we continue discussing that the nuclei, they can be having overlapping nature, but generally they are spoken to be restricted in particular segment of the brainstem. Say for example, now if we are talking about the rest of the cranial nerve, that is cranial number 9, 10, 11, 12. Where will be the nuclei found generally? And we see nerve number 9, 10, 11, 12. Their nuclei are found in the medulla oblongata. But then we definitely need to talk about the overlapping nuclei. Say for example, this fifth nerve nucleus is not only restricted to the pons. It will be extending into midbrain and the medulla oblongata. If you're talking about the fifth nerve, the motor nucleus, it will be in the pons. This is the one which is going to control the muscles of mastication because fifth nerve is the nerve of first pharyngeal arch. In the first pharyngeal arch, we have muscles of mastication developing and they are controlled by the motor nucleus of trigeminal, which is in the pons and relatively present medial near the midline if you compare with the sensory nuclei because sensory nuclei are located more laterally. Let us talk about them as well. This is going to be the main sensory nucleus of trigeminal. So here, the main sensory nucleus of trigeminal, we are showing restricted to the pons. But as we see, some of the neuron bodies are also extending into the midbrain. And we are calling this nucleus as the midbrain or mesencephalic sensory nucleus of the trigeminal. And similarly, we'll find that some of the neuron bodies extend into medulla oblongata and even enter the spinal cord. If this is the medulla oblongata, inferiorly it will continue as a spinal cord. So some of the neuron bodies passing through medulla oblongata moving into the spinal cord. Hence it is called as spinal sensory nucleus of trigeminal. So what are these nuclei receiving the sensation like? If we are talking about this spinal sensory nucleus of trigeminal, it is receiving sensations like touch, pain, temperature from the same side of the face. So as we mentioned, the sensations like touch, pain, temperature received from the same side of the face will be reaching spinal sensory nucleus of trigeminal. This touch is basically the crude touch. And we should know what is the difference between crude touch and fine touch. Crude touch is when you are taking a piece of cotton and touching. It is touch over wide area, so that is crude touch. On the contrary, if you take the tip of a pencil and touch, then you are touching a very narrow area and that is fine touch. So if it is the crude touch that is received by the spinal sensory nucleus of trigeminal, but if it is fine touch, like touching with the tip of a pencil, then it will be received by main sensory nucleus of trigeminal. So we can mention here, if it is the fine touch, then it will be received by the main sensory nucleus. In fact, the main sensory nucleus will be receiving most of the sensations except for the crude touch, pain temperature, and proprioception, the position sense. Because the position sense is actually received by mesencephalic sensory nucleus of trigeminal. So we can mention here, when we are talking about the proprioception or the position sense, it is going to be the position sense of structures like, say, the eyeball or the tongue or the mandible, as we understand, we cannot see these structures moving in our body. But we definitely know where is the eyeball moving. Up, down, right, left. Similarly, what about the tongue? Can you see your tongue? No, you cannot. But still you know it is going up, down, right and left. About the mandible, is the mouth open or closed? Is the mandible up or down? That position sense without even looking. How do we know that? That position sense is received by this mesencephalic sensory nucleus of trigeminal. So if it is lateral brainstem lesions, there'll be sensory problems related with the trigeminal nerve. And if it is medial brainstem lesions, like medial pontine syndrome, then there'll be problem with the muscles of mastication because motor nucleus is medial, M for M, whereas sensory nucleus, they are present laterally. Now we want to talk about the nerve number 9, 10, 11 nuclei as well. There, the 12th nerve nucleus will be found near the midline, whereas the number 9, 10, 11, their nuclei are present more laterally. 
Say for example, now number 9, 10, 11, making the nucleus ambiguous. That will be found in the lateral medulla. And we are going to show it here. This is the nerve number 9, 10, and 11. They are making what is called as nucleus ambiguous. And this nucleus ambiguous is basically going to control some of the pharyngeal arch muscles. The pharyngeal arch muscles which are developing in 3, 4, and 6. Basically, the muscles of palate, pharynx, and larynx. So, what are these muscles of palate, pharynx, and larynx supposed to do? They are the muscles of speech and swallowing. So, as we are mentioning, now number 9, 10, 11, their nuclei are more lateral, like nucleus ambiguous located here, away from the midline, bilaterally. The 12th nerve nuclei are near the midline. So, here we can show the 12th nerve nucleus near the midline, controlling the skeletal muscle of the tongue. The skeletal muscle of the tongue will be affected if there is a medial medullary syndrome. Some artery which is supplying the medial medulla has been compromised. So 12th nuclei compromise resulting in tongue muscle palsy. Whereas if some artery supplying the lateral medulla is compromised, then there will be lateral medullary ischemia. In lateral medullary ischemia, several nuclei can be involved, like the spinal sensory nucleus of trigeminal, the nucleus ambiguous, and one more nucleus you can discuss located in the lateral medulla is compromised. That nucleus is the nucleus rectus solitarius. If you remember, we have a mnemonic for that. Our mnemonic is SWAT NTS. And what is the full form of that? Special visceral sensation of the taste received by tip of nucleus tractus solitarius. So at the tip of nucleus tractus solitarius, we are receiving the taste sensation carried by the FGV nerve, facial, glossopharyngeal, and the vagus nerve. Now, if the a sensation is special visceral efferent, the nucleus tractus solitarius is SVA nucleus, a uh, sensory nucleus. What is the neural column for the nucleus ambiguous, which is the motor nucleus? In fact, that will be the SVE. So, as we talk about nucleus ambiguous, it is SVE, special visceral muscles. S for special, V for visceral, E for efferent or the muscles. So nucleus ambiguous is SVE, nucleus tractus solitaris is SVA. We continuously practice these neural columns as well because they keep coming as the MCQs in the entrance exam. The more we revise, the less mistakes we are going to make. So let us revise what are the clinical features we can see in this syndrome we were talking about. The Wellenberg syndrome, lateral medullary ischemia. It will have several features but uh, four of them can be discussed in this diagram. And what are the four features of lateral medullary syndrome or Wellenberg syndrome? As we mentioned, it could be due to a block in an artery supplying the lateral medulla. And one of the clinical features is vertigo. Number two, these patients of Wellenberg syndrome can have ipsilateral loss of touch pain temperature, especially the crude touch, because the spinal sensory nucleus of trigeminal is ischemic, lying in the lateral medulla. So number two, loss of touch pain temperature, ipsilaterally. Number three, there will be difficulty in speech and swallowing due to paralysis of the muscles, controlled by number 1911, nucleus ambiguous, the pharyngeal arch muscles developing in arch number 346, muscles of palate, pharynx and larynx. So difficulty in speech swallowing is one of the clinical features. And another clinical feature of Wellenberg syndrome is loss of taste sensation on the same side of the tongue because we have ischemia in the lateral medulla. The nucleus tractor solitarius is also compromised. So loss of taste sensation is the clinical feature number four. So in Wellenberg syndrome, we have got number one, vertigo due to the vestibular nucleus compromised in the lateral medulla. Number two, the spinal sensory nucleus compromised. So loss of touch pain temperature on the same side of face. Number three, it is difficulty speech swallowing due to paralysis of palate, pharynx, larynx muscle on the same side. And number four, loss of taste sensation. Nucleus tractus solitarius getting compromised. But in these patient will not have tongue muscle palsy. The tongue muscle palsy will be a feature of medial medullary syndrome and that is block of some different arteries supplying the medial medulla. So hypoglossal nucleus in ischemia, tongue muscle palsy. In medial medullary syndrome, we will not have features of vertigo or loss of sensation on the face or difficulty speech swallowing or loss of taste sensation. They are features of lateral medullary ischemia. They'll be absent in medial medullary syndrome. 
In this uh, discussion, we'll be talking about the seven neural columns and making a table for them, aligning them with the corresponding brainstem nuclei. It is important because we get some questions like we are looking at one of them and to attempt those questions, we must have adequate deep knowledge about the topic. Like this is one of the questions which is asking us about some pairs and these pairs are between the neural columns and their associated nuclei. We have to find out the wrong pair here. And before we start working upon these nuclei and their corresponding neural columns, let us gather some information and we can come back to find the appropriate answer later. As we understand, there are uh, three motor columns we talk about and uh, four sensory there. And when it comes to the motor components, the neural columns, which are three in number, could be talking about the skeletal muscles, or the visceral muscles. Now, as such, when we are talking about the skeletal muscles, most of the skeletal muscles, they are under the neural column G, S, E. That is G for general, S for somatic, the skeletal, and E for efferent or the muscle. So general skeletal muscle, general somatic muscle. Most of the skeletal muscles are actually G, S, E, except for the few of them which develop in the pharyngeal arches, the pharyngeal arch muscles, and they are in fact called as S, V, E, special visceral muscles. Though they are not visceral muscles and it appears like a misnomer, but the pharyngeal arch muscles, despite being skeletal muscles, are called as S for special, V for visceral, E for efferent or the muscles. And when we talk about the actual visceral muscles, this neural column is G, V, E, that is the general visceral efferent or general visceral muscles. Here you can talk about the cardiac muscles, the smooth muscles and even the glands because glands will be having basically the smooth muscles. So three motor columns and then we have four sensory columns. As we talk about the sensory columns, there is one called as G, S, A, G for general, S for somatic, a for efferent or sensation, general somatic sensation. And that could be the touch pain, temperature, pressure, vibration, stereonosis, proprioception, and all that. The general sensations, GSA. Whereas when you are talking about general vessel sensations like the angina pain, colicky pain, or carotid sinus, blood pressure, carotid body, chemoreception, these are vessel sensations and called as GVA, general visceral efferent. Angina pain, colicky pain, or chemoreception, or blood pressure. Now among the four sensory columns, there are two more and they are special sensations. These are general sensations and these are special sensations. One of them is called as the SSA, special somatic efferent. So these are special sensations and here we have the NA number two and NA number eight. NA number two for the vision and NA number eight for hearing and balance. So cranial number two for the vision and cranial number eight for the hearing and balance. They are considered as special somatic sensation, SSA. And then when it comes to the taste sensation or the smell sensation, we call them as SVA, special visceral sensation. It appears like a misnomer because maybe the smell or maybe the taste, they are basically not visceral sensations, but we call them as special visceral sensations. For the smell, it is the cranial number one, olfactory nerve. And for the taste, it is the FGV nerve, facial glossopharyngeal vagus nerve, carrying the taste sensation from the tongue. So this is the SVA neural column. Now it is to be understood when we are talking about the brainstem nuclei, there we cannot be talking about the cranial number one for smell pathway. So under the SVA column in the brainstem nuclei, we will be just focusing upon FGV nerve, facial glossopharyngeal vagus nerve. Similarly, if we are talking about the SSA neural column in the brainstem nuclei, you cannot be talking about the optic nerve. Optic nerve is the nerve of diencephalon and it does not have any nuclei in the brainstem, as is the olfactory nerve. Olfactory nerve is the nerve of teleencephalon, having no nuclei in the brainstem. Now with that orientation of four sensory nuclei and three motor nuclei, we are supposed to make two tables where one of them will be showing the neural columns and other will be showing the brainstem nuclei. So the two tables which we are supposed to make will be appearing like this. We'll be talking about the brainstem. In the brainstem, the midbrain, pons and medulla oblongata. As you see here, the midbrain, the pons and medulla oblongata showing the four sensory nuclei and the three motor nuclei. 
Also representing them in this table where we again show the seven neural columns here and the three component of the brain stem that is the midbrain, pons and medulla oblongata. We want to specifically locate those nuclei in the brain stem and then categorize them under various neural columns. There are various combinations which we need to know and then only we'll be able to handle the questions which are based upon the neural columns. We have one more diagram to look at before we start drawing these ourselves. Our tables will look something like this where we'll be talking about the motor neural columns and the sensory neural columns and then aligning them, the seven neural columns, with their nuclei in the brain stem, the midbrain, pons and medulla oblongata. It is a detailed discussion but one thing which we can understand here in the beginning itself is for every E column there is a corresponding A column. Say if we are having a GSE then there will be a corresponding GSA column. Similarly if we are having SVE neural column then there will be one SVA neural column. For the GVE, we have GVA neural column, but then one of the column that is SSA is alone. We do not have anything called as SSE in our body. So four sensory columns and three motor columns. Let us start drawing them ourselves in the tabular format now. We will be drawing two tables side by side. So here we draw the two tables. In the upper table, we'll be talking about the neural columns and in the lower table, we are going to talk about the brain stem nuclei and in the upper table we are supposed to divide it into two parts in the beginning so as to mention the two component in the first it is the motor or the efferent column and in the second it is going to be the sensory or the efferent column. We can remember one way efferent as the arrival and efferent as the exit e for e mean to say that when the center of a system is sending information out it is the exit it is going to be the motor pathway e for e efferent or exit controlling some muscles whereas from the periphery if some sensations are coming that is the efferent the sensation then it is the arrival so arrival efferent and exit efferent motor is basically mostly talking about the muscles and here we are going to talk about three motor columns and four sensory column let us divide those column and rows here once again we'll be having three motor columns and then there'll be four sensory columns then as we talk about the lower table they will be dividing the table into certain columns where we can talk about the components of the brainstem like here we can put the three parts of the brainstem namely the midbrain here and followed by the pons and then the medulla oblongata so in here this row represents the midbrain, this is the pons and medulla oblongata and then we are going to put seven neural columns showing their nuclei in the respective part of the brainstem. Now let us start from the neural columns here. As we focus upon the motor neural columns, it is understood that skeletal muscles, they can be two type. Most of the skeletal muscles are basically the GSE neural column and there is a very small group of muscles which are called as the SVE. Now when you say most of the skeletal muscles are GSE, what about the SVE neural column? They are basically the pharyngeal arch muscles. Now we want to talk about their cranial nerve nuclei. Which cranial nerve nuclei you will be considering under this GSE neural column? See GSE neural column is most of the skeletal muscles and if we are talking about the brain stem, there will be the skeletal muscles which do not develop in the pharyngeal arches. Basically they are going to be the muscles of the eyeball and the tongue. Because the muscles of eyeball and tongue, they do not develop in the pharyngeal arches. So if the GSE, which is general somatic efferent or general skeletal muscles, the eyeball muscles and the tongue muscles, which cranial nerve you will be talking about? under the GSC column, G for general, S for somatic or skeletal and E for muscle or you can say efferent, efferent means muscle. They will be now number 3, 4, 6 because eyeball has a formula LR6, SO4, remainder 3 and for the tongue you have 12th nerve. So now number 3, 4, 6 and 12 will be under the GSC neural column. Now let us represent this GSC neural column from here to here. As we are writing here GSE, general somatic efferent, which nuclei you will be showing in the midbrain. As we have seen now number 3 and 4, 
their nuclei are in the midbrain. At the level of superior colliculus, we have the number three. And at the level of inferior colliculus in the midbrain, we have the number four nuclei. So under the GSC column, we have the number three, four in the midbrain. What about the nucleus of the number six under the GSC column? Under GSC column, the number six is in the pons, in the lower pons. So here we are showing the nucleus number six, abducens nucleus. These are the nuclei controlling eyeball muscle. Then we have the number 12 under the GSC column controlling the tongue muscle and we can tell it is present in the medulla oblongata. Actually medial medulla oblongata, if you remember, in medial medullary syndrome, there will be tongue muscle palsy. These nuclei, which are under the category GSE, they are near the midline. So, number 3, 4, near the midline. Medial midbrain. Now number 6, nucleus, medial pontine. And number 12, medial medulla. Point is, if there is a medial midbrain syndrome due to some ischemia or medial pontine syndrome or medial medullary syndrome, the nerves, the nuclei which are compromised belong to GSE neural column. Paralysis of some of the skeletal muscles which do not develop in the pharyngeal arches. Now, talking about the pharyngeal arch muscles, which nuclei will you keep under SVE? It is the pharyngeal arch muscles. So, Nuclei are the number 5, 7, 9, 10, and 11. Let us talk more about this SVE neural column here. What is the full form of SVE? From S, we understand it is the special, and V is the visceral, E is the muscle. Muscle means efferent. So special visceral muscles. These muscles are pharyngeal arch muscles. They are actually skeletal muscle. It appears like a misnomer to be calling them as SVE. So under the SVE neural column, which nuclei you will be talking about? It is the number 5, 7, 9, 10, 11. As you discuss the pharyngeal arch muscles, what is the nerve of the first pharyngeal arch? And which muscles are developing here? The first pharyngeal arch has the mandibular nerve, branch of trigeminal, and the muscles developing in first arch are the muscles of mastication. Whereas the second pharyngeal arch has the facial nerve, muscles of facial expression developed here, supplied by the facial nerve. Coming to the arch number 3, 4, 6, we are having now number 9, 10, and 11. The cranial part of 11, cranial accessory nerve, making what is called as the nucleus ambiguous. And that nucleus ambiguous, which is having the number 9, 10, 11, will be controlling the muscles of palate and pharynx and larynx. These are the muscles which are involved in speech and swallowing, developing in arch number 3, 4, 6. Now recently there has been a mention of cranial accessory nerve not existing at all. In the latest editions of Gray's Anatomy, they are mentioning that the existence of cranial part of accessory nerve is doubtful. But since all the authors, especially Indian authors, they continue mentioning about the cranial accessory nerve, we'll continue following that. So the number 1911 making nucleus ambiguous for the arch number 346, muscles of palate pharynx larynx, where is this nucleus located in the brainstem? As we try to represent this neural column, that is skeletal muscle under the SVE column, the pharyngeal arch muscles, the number 579011, as shown in this table. The number 5, the nucleus under the SVE column can be shown in the pons. So in the pons, we are showing the fifth nerve nucleus. This fifth nerve nucleus in the pons is the motor nucleus of trigeminal controlling the muscles of mastication developing in first pharyngeal arch. On the other hand, if we talk about the facial nerve nucleus controlling the muscles of second arch, muscles of facial expression, then it is also in the pons. So this is seventh nerve nucleus in the pons. Whereas, as we talk about the nucleus ambiguous, the number 1911, cranial part of 11, that is present in the medulla oblongata. So this is the nerve number 9, 10 and cranial part of 11, the nucleus ambiguous located in the medulla oblongata. If you remember, it is in the lateral medulla. When there is a lateral medullary ischemia, Wellenberg syndrome, there were muscles of palate, pharynx, larynx paralyzed, difficulty speech swallowing. So that means the neural column SVE is present in the lateral part of the brain stem. The GSC is affected in the medial brainstem syndromes like medial medullary syndrome, 12th nerve involved, 
whereas the SVE column is in the lateral brain stem. So will be affected in lateral pontine syndrome, number 57, lateral medullary syndrome, nucleus ambiguous. Now we have discussed two of the motor column. What about the third motor column, which is called as the GVE column. So talking about that GVE column, we can discuss it here. G for general, V for visceral, and E for muscle, the cardiac and smooth muscle. Now, when we are talking about cardiac and smooth muscles, it is basically the autonomic nervous system. And as we say, it is the autonomic nervous system. Which part of autonomic nervous system? Is it sympathetic or parasympathetic? We have to be careful when we talk about the brainstem. Brainstem can have only parasympathetic nuclei. So basically, we are talking about the parasympathetic component, the GVE, general visceral muscles, the cardiac smooth muscles, and we have to discuss some of the nuclei under this column. To discuss this third motor column, and the corresponding cranial nerve nuclei, let us make use of this space here. The GVE, general visceral muscles, the autonomic nervous system, especially the parasympathetic system. In the autonomic nervous system, basically we are having three effectors. Could be the cardiac muscles or the smooth muscles or even the glands because glands are going to have smooth muscles basically. And in this autonomic nervous system, the parasympathetic component, we are having some nerves. Now number three, seven, nine, ten. So now number three, seven, nine, ten, they carry the parasympathetic fibers. We want to talk about their nuclei. As we say, now number three, seven, nine, ten, what is going to be the name of the nuclei and what are the effectors they are controlling? Now number three is having Edinger Westphal nucleus controlling some smooth muscles of the eyeball. So as we talk about the cranial number three, it is having a parasympathetic nucleus, Edinger Westphal nucleus controlling some smooth muscles of the eyeball. And what about the now number seven? Now number seven and nine, they are actually having superior salivatory nucleus, inferior salivatory nucleus controlling some of the salivary glands. And may it be the superior or the inferior, these uh, salivatory nuclei will be found in the lower pons. As we want to represent them in the brainstem, we'll be showing them here. And what about the vagus nerve? Vagus nerve, the parasympathetic nucleus under the GVE column is dorsal nucleus of vagus. It is a motor nucleus controlling effectors like the cardiac muscles and the smooth muscles and even the glands because glands are having smooth muscles basically. Now, where are you going to put these nuclei under the GVE column in the brain stem? As it is understood, now number three is having Edinger westphal nucleus must be in the midbrain, in the upper midbrain at the level of superior colliculus. So Edinger westphal nucleus is in the midbrain at the level of superior colliculus under the GVE neural column controlling some smooth muscles in the eyeball. When we talk about the nerve number 79, superior and inferior salivatory nucleus controlling salivary glands, they'll be shown in the lower pons. So may it be the superior salivatory nucleus or may it be the inferior salivatory nucleus, now number seven or nine, we are showing them in the lower pons. Now this can be confusing for some students as they will mention, ninth nerve nuclei should be in the medulla oblongata. Why are we showing it in the pons? For this I have already mentioned, though the cranial nerves are supposed to be restricted in their particular location, but there can be overlapping nuclei. And in fact, the ninth nerve, Salivatory nucleus extends into the pawn. So number seven, superior salivatory nucleus. Number nine, inferior salivatory nucleus will be in the lower pawns controlling some of the salivary glands. As it comes to number 10, that is dorsal nucleus of vagus, it'll be found in the medulla oblongata. So in the medulla oblongata, we can show this is going to be the dorsal nucleus of the vagus under the GVE neural column. So here we have represented the three motor columns and their corresponding nuclei. Let us now focus upon the four sensory column. For that we already have mentioned, whenever there is one E column, there is always one corresponding A column. If I have GVE, there must be a GVA. If there's a SVE, there must be one SVA. And if there is GSC, then there must be one GSA. But one thing was, 
we were having one neural column SSA and there is no corresponding SSE in our body, so it is alone. The special somatic sensation is not having a paired motor nucleus. Now, focusing upon GVA, which sensation are you going to talk about under GVA? See, it is the counterpart of GVE, so cardiac muscle, the angina pain, the smooth muscle, the colicky pain. May it be the cardiac muscle pain, the angina pain, or the smooth muscle pain, that is the colicky pain. We'll have to consider it under GVA neural column. And here only we should contain the blood pressure sensation received by the carotid sinus and blood pH, blood CO2 as received by the carotid body. They're all GVA, general visceral sensation. And if you remember, they'll be sending this general visceral sensation to the bottom of nucleus tractus solitarius. So as we talk about nucleus tractus solitarius, it is having a tip and bottom, and to the bottom comes the blood pressure sensation, or the blood pH CO2 sensation, or the pain of angina, colicky pain. This is nucleus tractus solitarius, receiving the general vessel sensation, GVA. Then what about the tip of the nucleus tractus solitarius? As we understand, the tip will be receiving the taste sensation. And what is the neural column for the taste sensation? The mnemonic SWAT NTS, the special visceral sensation of taste received by the tip of nucleus tractus solitarius. And which nerves are carrying the taste sensation? FGV, the facial, glossopharyngeal, and vagus nerve, carrying the taste sensation to the tip of nucleus tractus solitarius. So nucleus tractus solitarius is a composite nucleus, not only receiving the SVA, but also it receives the GVA neural column. And we can show that in this table as well. Where would you represent the nucleus tractus solitarius in the brainstem? It is present in the medulla oblongata. So as you show, this is the neural column, which is a composite neural column. May it be the SVA or the GVA. There is a common nucleus that is nucleus tractus solitarius. And that nucleus tractus solitarius we are showing in the medulla oblongata. So this is nucleus tractus solitarius shown in the medulla oblongata. What about the other neural columns? Like there is one which is called as GSA, general somatic sensation. In general somatic sensations, you can include touch, pain, temperature, or pressure and vibration, or proprioception. And since we are in the head and neck region, since we are talking about the brain stem, the cranial nerves, it is basically trigeminal nerve. So trigeminal nerve carrying the general somatic sensation, touch pain, temperature, pressure vibration, or the proprioception. You remember the nuclei? There were three sensory nuclei for trigeminal. If it is touch pain, temperature, spinal sensory nucleus of trigeminal. If it is the pressure vibration, the main sensory nucleus of trigeminal. If it is the proprioception, then it was midbrain or mesencephalic sensory nucleus of trigeminal. So all that under the GSA, we can represent here. GSA, neural column, and the main sensory nucleus of trigeminal. We are showing now in the pons. So this is the main sensory nucleus which is shown in the pons. It will receive all the sensation of the face except few. For example, if you are talking about proprioception, then proprioception is not received by the pontine nuclei. It was received by a nucleus called as mesencephalic, sensory nucleus of trigeminal extending into the midbrain. So in the midbrain, we have mesencephalic sensory nucleus of trigeminal receiving general somatic sensation of proprioception. What about touch, pain, temperature, especially the crude touch? The crude touch, pain, temperature was carried by spinal sensory nucleus of trigeminal, which you can show here. This new nucleus is extending into the spinal cord, passing through the medulla oblongata. So passing the medulla oblongata, it will enter the spinal cord also. Hence it is called as spinal sensory nucleus of trigeminal. And the sensation it was carrying were the ipsilateral touch pain temperature, the crude touch. If it is fine touch, it should be received by main sensory nucleus of trigeminal located in the pons. But all these sensations are basically GSA, general somatic sensations. And then one neural column is left, which is called as the SSA. So this SSA, which you are representing here, a special somatic sensation. 
and those special somatic sensation belong to the vision and hearing balance. Now number two and now number eight. So as you are talking about special somatic sensation of the vision, that is cranial number two and hearing and balance, which is cranial number eight, you can represent them in this part of the table. But again, since we are talking about the brainstem, in the brainstem you don't see the optic nerve nucleus. Optic nerve is the nerve of diencephalon, has nothing to do with the brainstem as such. So only nucleus which you are supposed to talk about is 8th nerve, vestibulocochlear nucleus, not the second. So under the SSA neural column, where would you put the 8th nerve nucleus, the vestibulocochlear nucleus? We do remember they are at the ponto medullary junction. So at the Junction of the pons and medulla, we have the vestibulocochlear nuclei. Under the special somatic sensation, SSA neural column for hearing and balance. So what we have done here is in the three parts of the brainstem, we are representing some of the cranial nerve nuclei under various neural columns, three motor and four sensory neural columns. Eventually, this will help us to take care of the MCQ, which we encountered in the beginning of this discussion. Basically, it was based upon these four major nuclei. The 12th nerve nucleus controlling tongue muscle under the GSC column, general somatic muscles, and nucleus ambiguous, the number 9, 10, 11, controlling the muscles of palate, pharynx, larynx under the SVE column, special vessel muscles, pharyngeal arch muscles. Then this neural column is the general vessel efferent, Autonomic nervous system, basically parasympathetic system, having a nucleus, dorsal nucleus of vagus, controlling the cardiac muscle, smooth muscle, and smooth muscles of the glands as well. And then the fourth nucleus, nucleus tractor solitarius, having two parts, tip for the taste, the SVA, and bottom to receive the chemoreception, pressoreception under GVA general vessel sensation. Once you have the knowledge of these four nuclei, we can go back to the question and try to find the appropriate answer. And as we come back to our question, it was asking us, which of the following pair is a mismatch, the exception? Now, looking at choice number A, that is hypoglossal nucleus, is it under the GSE column? G is for general, S is somatic or skeletal, E is efferent or muscle, general skeletal muscle, general somatic efferent. Actually, most of the skeletal muscle in our body are GSE, except a very small group of muscle, which are pharyngeal arch muscles. Only pharyngeal arch muscles are the skeletal muscles, which are not GSE. So, what about the 12th nerve nucleus? Actually, 12th nerve nucleus, the nerve which control tongue muscles, or the number 3, 4, 6 nuclei control the eyeball muscle. The eyeball muscle, tongue muscles, they do not develop in pharyngeal arches. So obviously they are under the normal category GSE. There is no problem with this. Maybe it is the number 3, 4, 6 or the number 12. They do not develop in pharyngeal arches and they definitely are GSE. Most of the skeletal muscles are GSE except very few which actually are SVE, special visceral muscles, the pharyngeal arch muscles. Though they are skeletal muscles, but they are called as visceral muscles. Maybe it is a misnomer. So, is the choice number B okay? If you are talking about nucleus ambiguous, it is the number 9, 10, 11. Cranial parts of 11, cranial accessory nerve. This nucleus ambiguous representing the number 9, 10, 11 control the muscles of palate, pharynx, larynx for speech and swallowing. Arch number 3, 4, 6. They are pharyngeal arch muscles. So no problem with this choice number B. Nucleus ambiguous, the number 9 to 11, muscles of palate, pharynx, larynx. Pharyngeal arch muscles, definitely SVE. The problem is actually with choice number C. That is a wrong pairing and that is your answer of exception. Why it is the answer of exception? Because the dorsal nucleus of vagus is a motor nucleus. So, so motor nucleus cannot have the term A. It is not GVA, it is GVE, general visceral muscles. The dorsal nucleus of vagus, which is present in the medulla oblongata, is a parasympathetic nucleus. It is a motor nucleus to control cardiac muscles, smooth muscle, and the glands. It is under the category GVE, not GVA. So that means this is a wrong matching and this is the answer of exception, fine. But then, which nucleus the GVA belong to? Now, may it be GVA or SVA, they have a common nucleus. 
and that common nucleus is nucleus tractus solitarius. If it is a tip of nucleus tractus solitarius, it is SVA. If it is the bottom of nucleus tractus solitarius, then it is GVA. So may it be GVA or SVA, they have a common nucleus, which is nucleus tractus solitarius. Upper portion receiving taste sensation and lower portion receiving the general vessel sensations, like the blood pressure sensation or the chemoreception. So GVA or SVA, this is the nucleus. Choice number C remains as our answer because dorsal nucleus of Vega says not GVA. It should be GVE. Subscribe and press the bell icon so you never miss an update from Prep Ladder.